Phone lab can be horribly inaccessible and incredibly frustrating. It is to game design what ventriloquism is to comedy. But I need to make something clear to you guys. Bone Lab does have a lot of great qualities. I thoroughly enjoyed Boneworks, and I think Stress Level Zero is a great studio with talented employees and excellent ideas. I also have a pretty big soft spot for the face of the company, Brandon. <sighs> I like his energy, and I find his passion for VR games to be massively endearing. Brandon and the rest of his team have crafted an impressive physics engine, an interesting world, Interesting. And some of the most fun and creative gameplay mechanics VR has to offer. I mean, where else could you do this? I got him. <laughs> this is how you play. This is motion sickness is what it is. I don't need to do that. Fuck. Ooh, that makes you feel like I want to gag. Ooh, that's gaming right there. But to make it even better, Stress Level Zero went the extra mile and optimized Bone Lab so that it could be played literally anywhere. Now a good chunk of the time, Bone Lab is incredible fun. But the other chunk of the time, there's an awful lot of terrible game design that is consistently getting in the way of the game's fun factor. Like for example, the pu Let's talk about one of the first puzzles in the game. Oh, shit. Before we do that, please keep in mind that while I do love handheld games, I hate having my hand held in games. And Bone Lab would have seriously benefited from just some kind of guidance, because at least as far as the puzzles go, this game doesn't tell you a damn thing. Buddy, look out. We're doing a transition, a green screen. Trent, get out of the way, bud. Hey, get out of the way. What I'm trying to say here is I generally like it when a game doesn't give me very much direction and lets me figure things out on my own. I loaded up some obligatory footage of me playing Elden Ring to desperately prove this to you. Woo wee! Woo, that's one tough game right there, I tell ya. Anyway, it's time to go play something much, much worse. Oh, also, really quickly, it needs to be said, I know I'm no game developer. I don't know anything about game design, but I do know that Bone Lab is fucking whacked when it comes to design, if that makes sense. See you in there. So about 10 minutes into the game, you're meant to open this door. How do you get in there? Well, it's a little strange. First, you gotta enter into each of these six doors individually, which are located here in the game's central hub. After entering a door, a beam of light will emit from above each door, indicating that you've been inside of that door. Inside of his nightmares, where seconds feel like minutes, and minutes feel like hours, and hours feel like theirs. That beam of light above the door means you've uncovered a power orb. A power orb which needs to be placed into a slot here. To do that, you just pick the orb up using this gravitational crane that you operate with a lever. See, like, this is gonna take a long time. Now I gotta do that five more times. I'm not even sure if this whole experience even counts as being a puzzle, because it honestly feels more like busy work. Apart from the six lights above the door, this game gives you absolutely no indication as to what you're supposed to do in order to progress. Or at least, that's what I initially thought. There's also this kiosk here, which sorta tells you what to do, but when I looked at that on my first playthrough, I had no idea what it was trying to tell me, so I dismissed it as some sort of world building or something. And what's frustrating is the game tries to make this entire sequence feel like some sort of puzzle, but what's really happening here is the developers are flat out withholding information from us, or delivering that information in a suboptimal manner, and calling that the puzzle. This is what Bone Lab does. Okay, so there's six of these that I gotta... Right, so 
turn these on. You follow the pipes? There's also six rooms around. You just have to complete one of each, or do I put some things up there? I'm sure plenty of people have gotten stuck here. Is there no game here? This is so beautiful, but I don't know how to play it. There's all this extra content you can do, which is awesome, but I couldn't find the story, which is the one thing I wanted to do. <laughs> so how do you play this game? When you never know what the game is trying to tell you or what it wants from you, that's when it becomes all too easy to start overthinking. And we have ignition. From there, things only got worse. Those six orbs opened up a big door. And behind that big door is another big door. Another big door that you can't open. But hey, this thing looks familiar. It looks like I can probably fit something onto this slot, like maybe a broken button or even a battery. Come to think of it, it looks an awful lot like the slots I put some batteries into earlier. And placing batteries into slots was something you did often in the first game. So off I went in search of a battery. First I thought that maybe I can pull one of these out and reuse them. Nope. So I go and start pulling grates off the wall and search for a battery underground. And it was here where I found an item ball. Now, in the first game, if you were to find one of these, you were supposed to keep it in your inventory until the very end of the level where there was a bin you could throw it into which would unlock that item. Unlocking that item would allow you to summon it with the spawning gun here so that you can fool around with it. And here in Bone Lab, you can also use unlocked items to help you in time trials and things like that. These item unlocks can be really valuable too if you intend on just playing around with all the toys in the game's sandbox. So I found several item balls throughout my playthrough, but I had no idea what to do with them because I couldn't find a reclamation bin to throw them into. I didn't find out until much later that to unlock these, you simply pull them apart. Fuck. You just pop them open. I really wish the game told me I could do that. You can't do this in the first game, so as a veteran of this series, why would I even try doing that? I wasted so much damn time because of this change. Like, look here. I enter this huge room. I immediately know that I'm meant to go in there. But I also know that I might find a secret somewhere out here. So I wander around for about five minutes, I climb all the way on top of this ladder I found, and I find an item ball on the top. And naturally, I want to unlock this gun, so I spend another few minutes searching for a reclamation bin that doesn't exist. Then I try figuring out how to put this thing in my inventory, only to realize that I can't, so then I toss the ball away in frustration and move on. And it would appear that I wasn't alone, because the developers added in a little picture tutorial, which wasn't here on my first playthrough. But hey, better late than never, right? I feel pretty validated in my confusion here, but I do wonder. If I played Boneworks for dozens of hours and still felt this lost about basic mechanics in Bone Lab, how is somebody with zero experience in the first game expected to figure everything out? This game tells you next to nothing, and it's so consistently unintuitive that you just feel so damn lost most of the time. <laughs> I want to let you guys in on a little trade secret that some of us video game YouTube reviewers do from time to time. Sometimes when reviewing a game, we like to try to make the video evoke the same emotions that the game stirred up inside of us. Which is why I've attempted to make this video a little bit disjointed, with confused jokes and abrupt segments that work but also don't. And then look at this. Why would I wear this shirt with a bunch of text on it in broken English nonetheless, when I know for a fact that a shirt like this is just going to distract people from the overall video. <laughs> but that's Bone Lab. I did it all in the hopes that this video would come off as slightly unintuitive, a little bit off, so that I could give you, the viewer, a little taste of what Bone Lab gave me. There was no additional button or battery that I was meant to find here. Instead, I was meant to ignore this thing completely and walk just off to the side of it to go into this room. Now, to be fair, you are given a visual cue to give you a hint as to where you're supposed to go. It's this debris that's on the ground, which I consciously saw the very first time I walked into this room, but I didn't think that it held any importance, especially not when I thought that I had already been given a task to complete in the form of restoring this button. I mean, think about it. What's going to seem more important to the player? This device that's sticking out in the center of the room, which holds the potential of opening the door, or a couple of chunks of trash on the ground? This is easy to miss, especially in VR, where it's all too easy and far too common to just feel visually overwhelmed by everything. 
In these first areas of the game, playtesting showed us that players in VR were easily distracted, often due to better peripheral vision, such that they'd focus on one scene element while losing track of others. Since a VR game must always be rendered from a virtual camera that matches the player's own point of view, we have limited opportunities to control what the player sees. This entire section of the map, from the start of the keycard puzzle up to this room, was added specifically to show the player the vault on its own. Even though players are required to enter this room to get the second keycard, they still wouldn't necessarily notice the vault outside, so we added some dialogue with Russell about looking out the window to see it. This may be a bit heavy-handed, but it was necessary to solve the problem of players not recognizing the vault when they saw it later in the game. Sounds like they should have hired those guys to work on Bone Lab, eh, Alex? <laughs> Thanks, Russell. The only reason I saw this opening was because I got lucky. Unfortunately, I only spent about five minutes searching for this, but I can see somebody losing up to maybe even a half an hour before having to look up a guide. If they want the majority of their players to look up here right away, they need more than just this, right? We need this, this glass here needs to be broken and shattered. Maybe ha have a blast crater up against the wall here and a little bit on the, the teen. Right? With chunks of concrete just kind of missing from the wall here. Maybe a little bit of smoke going up. Oh, this thing too? This thing needs to be destroyed or just completely removed. Otherwise, what is this thing's purpose? Or even better yet, what if the explosion just happened as soon as you open this door, right when you come into this room? Then you would immediately look up there. You'd know right away. Doing all of that would inform the player on where to go without actually having to tell the player where to go. And here's the thing too, I understand. Yes, this is a little bit my fault. I am somewhat to blame for missing this door, but also, I wouldn't have missed this door had they done any of the handful of things I suggested. So maybe it's not really my fault after all. And yeah, okay, yes, I get it. I'm talking an awful lot about a couple of pieces of debris on the floor, right? Yeah, get the debris on the camera, exactly. But that's only because I need you guys to be debris on this. Because something small like debris placement in a video game can actually matter a whole lot. <laughs> Sometime later in the game, you're faced with another puzzle, and it couldn't be simpler. All you gotta do is hit that big red button. But the thing is, every other red button in the game only required you to tap it in order for it to activate. So you can imagine my befuddlement when the game silently expected me not to tap, but to hold this particular button in order to progress. What did it do? Did it open that? There's nothing here to indicate to the player that they need to hold this button down. What? <laughs> So when you finally figure out the solution here, you just end up feeling cheated because it took you three minutes to figure out something that should have taken three seconds. Wow. Applause. I think um, what threw me in there is like when you hit the button, there's nothing to indicate that it hasn't been held long enough. There are a dozen simple ways that they could have indicated to the player that this button needs to be held. Like, I don't know, make it a different color or put some kind of symbol on it. Maybe give us a sound cue to let us know that the door we cannot see because it is behind us is moving. That'd be nice, you know, rather than silence. There's even a light strip here connected to the button. It would have made a whole lot of sense to have the color of the light strip change while it's being held, but it doesn't. Why? Why are we dragging this huge pillar across the room to hold the button as a solution? When there's all these other boxes in the room, are they meant to be stood on? Like, are they red herrings? And why, you might ask, have I chosen to highlight such a seemingly insignificant puzzle for a large portion of this video? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because that button right there is emblematic of so much of the puzzle design in this game. And it just goes to show you how unintuitive Bone Lab can be as a whole. And you know what? What's even worse is, I'm pretty sure that one of these puzzles here bugged out on me. Look, watch. Here's how you progress. Press this button here to spawn the wall. Press this, and it will hit the button, and you can proceed. Okay, where's it? Where do these go? When you launch them up, well. <laughs> And then what do I do? See? I knew it. 
There is a language that video games have with their players, a mode of communication that stress level zero have completely neglected. Video games need to somehow communicate to the player as to whether or not they are doing something correctly. If so, it works. Are you kidding me? I... <laughs> okay. I'm speechless. What's... What is the point of it all? What is it? You could just shoot it. How, how is the real way you solve that? That's... I mean... Uh, we don't need to have our hand held, but we need something to let us know that we're moving in the right direction. Whether it be a line of dialogue telling us to climb a pipe, or maybe even just a waypoint telling us to go somewhere. This doesn't feel like the way I'm supposed to solve it. <laughs> Come on. Ugh. Yeah! Riveting. And what I find interesting about all of this is the developers kind of want you to break their game. Or at least that's what the tutorial and Boneworks encouraged you to do. The devs want you to be creative and find some sort of wacky solution to a puzzle that even they didn't intend for. And I think it's so awesome that the game supports such a high level of player creativity. But what's not awesome was the experience that myself and many others had trying to figure out all this bullshit. The one time I felt satisfaction for solving something in this game came as the result of a bug. I got stuck here in this gravity beam. I couldn't move at all. I was thinking that maybe I have to exit out of the entire game when I remembered that I had a weapon I could use to punch myself in the body and propel me out of the gravity beam. And that felt pretty cool, because even though the game kind of broke, I was able to fix it. There we go. And I know I've been slinging a lot of criticism at this game, so I'd like to just take a moment to reiterate that this game is so much fun. The guns feel great, and they taste even better. And I gotta say, I love the side content here. There's a parkour time trial, which is a recreation of the opening scene from Matrix Resurrections, which was a recreation of the opening scene from a different movie called The Matrix. It just feels so damn cool to run along the rooftops as bullets whiz past your cranium and you jump from one building to the other while entering slow motion to shoot your enemies in the air. There's an arena where there are just jump pads all over it and you can bounce all over the room, killing stuff. To me, this is what Bone Lab is all about. Because VR offers up gameplay fantasies that other mediums simply can't. The puzzles in this game get in the way of the fun Bone Lab allows you to have, and as a result, they usually feel like a waste of time. I can hold down a button to solve a puzzle in just about any other game, but I can't do this. Stop resisting! Need back up! Halfway through the game, I thought things might improve as I was introduced to a new mechanic, which is actually pretty amazing. You can change your avatar at any point in time, and you will possess the characteristics of the avatar you change into, so you can be really strong, really long, or wear a thong. This mechanic is super creative and lends itself to unlimited gameplay potential. But apart from creating the mechanic itself, Stress Level Zero didn't do very much with it. They do tutorialize you when this mechanic is first introduced, which at this point is more than welcome. And each avatar has its own dedicated mission to familiarize you with that avatar. But these missions just wound up feeling so hollow to me. The first avatar section had you playing as a strong bikey man from a bikey game. It was intended to be a beat-em-up section Section where you're meant to kill all these men with just your fists and whatever melee weapons you can find on your way to the exit. And it's a welcome change of pace since there hasn't been any melee sections in the game yet. Except they forgot to take your guns away from you, so you can just ignore the gimmick of this level completely. Now, I guess you could argue that this is good design because it allows for more player freedom, but I'd argue that it's bad design because it makes the entire gimmick of this section pointless. Like, let us use the guns later on for when we replay this as a tactical trial, which is something you can do. After that, you have a cat girl avatar level. Her whole shtick is that she's quick, so you're given a little parkour course to run around in and show off her mobility. And this course is just so bland. There's not much to this, really. You're just kind of running around and jumping. And this section pales in comparison to the Ninja Warrior segments that the game offers up as side content. And then in the middle of it, you stumble into a puzzle that's just as intuitive as you'd expect. What did that accomplish? 
What did hitting the button do? And it absolutely kills the intended fast pace of this segment. After that, there's a big boy avatar section, which is like a little tower defense thing. You're trying to make sure that this pillar here doesn't reach zero health while throwing and punching enemies off of the bridge to keep them from damaging it. I think it's okay. I think there are far better ways to show off the strength of this avatar, rather than just punching guys. But at least there's nothing here that throws off the pacing or completely negates the level's gimmick. But then, there's the moon. Something in the moon, it goes for you. Now, I'll freely admit that this was somewhat my fault. But in my defense, I was kind of overwhelmed at this point. I had just been anamorphed into a cat, and I had just arrived on the moon, so I was eager to play around with items in low gravity. So because of that, I missed this. A photograph that shows me exactly where I need to go to end this level. But because I missed this photograph, I spent over 30 minutes just walking around on the moon trying to figure out what the hell I'm supposed to do. Oh, this can't be. The game isn't this way, right? Where it's just like walk around the moon for 15 minutes and do what? It wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. But what do I do on the moon? Well, this absolutely insufferable song played on a loop. Are you here, Kim? Yeah. I wish you could hear this song. Cause it's, Kim, baby, let me tell you, it's a I'm in hell. Now this song's okay at first, right? But imagine having this song in your head nonstop for 30 minutes. I got noose for you. It sucks. The song is looped. I think six times. It feels like I'm in some kind of carnivalous space hell. I think I found where to go. This might be where I came from. I think I came from here. I don't know what to do. This is it now. This is my life. This fucking song. Here we go. Here we go. Something new. This probably, I know this isn't what I'm supposed to do. I know that. I am, I, but, the, but I don't know what else to do on the moon. Fuck! No! No! Okay. Oh my god. I almost got Sandra bollocked. I feel like that has to be something. But it isn't. There's a ladder even for me to climb. Like, wh how, how could this not be something? This is a shape I've interacted with multiple times in the game. It even says do not open. Earlier in the game, there was a puzzle that said do not open. And when I opened it, I progressed. But now, watch this. Watch. You see that? Nothing. Why? I don't fucking know. Look. Help! And can they hear me in there? Help! Help! Oh my god. I'm gonna blow it up. What do I do? On the moon. And I am not the only person who missed this picture. When I went to download this moon song from YouTube, down in the comments section, I saw that a lot of people shared my plight, which made one thing blatantly obvious to me as if it weren't already. This game would have seriously benefited from more playtesting. And to make it all worse, the moon itself was utterly lifeless. All it had was a handful of buildings, some item balls, and some moon dust. Not a single NPC, not a scripted event, nothing. It did, however, have a spawn gun, which I was expected to use in order to create my own fun. I can, I can climb him. Whoa, he's huge. And he's a good listener. Whoa. When I play through a single player campaign, I want a curated experience, you know? If I wanted to simply wander around and goof off, I would go into the sandbox mode, which has a spawn gun, and mess around with the NPCs and low gravity over there. The fact that there's nothing to this mission is so jarring as well, because all of the other individual avatar sections had a semi-thoughtful linear gameplay sequence. I just wish we could have gotten a decently crafted single player mission for our first trip to the moon in VR, with some neat script events, or maybe a mechanic that involves putting on an astronaut's helmet and having to seal up the cracks when it gets shot, or a puzzle that utilizes low gravity which would of course ultimately end up making me look stupid. Something that takes advantage of the fact that we're on the moon, rather than just giving us a blank canvas. I think an opportunity was missed here. After that, you play as an anime girl who needs to do three laps around this racetrack in a go-kart. This was pretty decent. The controls for the go-kart are really funky, as pressing up on the right thumbstick is how you accelerate, but the music really helped to sell this segment and make it feel extra special. The composer for this game, Michael Wyckoff, did an excellent job, and I think this song is a clever little reference to an arcade series called Initial D, which has a lot of music like this.
You know, I never understood why they called those games Initial D. Because the letter D is already an initial. So why do they feel the need to tell us that the letter D is an initial? It's a waste of time, but that has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. So we'll cut back to the video. Anyway, I was still so pissed off about the moon that I wasn't able to enjoy this segment like I wanted to. Plus, if you manage to tip the go-kart over, your anime girl is too weak to Boku no pick up the cart to set it back on the ground wheels down. So if that happens to you, I think you just have to run around the entire course on foot. And after completing all three laps, you're given the ability to swap to any of these avatars at any point in time before being sent off into what is easily the best part of this game. It's just a couple of normal levels where you're encouraged to play around with the avatar mechanic. There are some puzzles here, and while they weren't really very interesting as they only required you to roll a ball into a slot, they did feel intuitive for once. And overall, this portion of the game was wonderful. It had excellent presentation and good locational variety as you go from a dark wooded area into a subway before ending it all in a medieval fantasy land. It was everything you would want out of a VR game nowadays. It was fun, novel, and filled me with a sense of curiosity. But as much fun as it all was, I don't think it utilized the avatar changing mechanic enough. You have to swap around a couple of times to progress, but there's nothing here that encourages the player to be creative. It would have been nice to have had more incentives to play around with this, because like I said before, stress level zero didn't do enough with this mechanic. Instead, it seems that they've put the expectation on you. They want the players to create mods for their game in order to keep it alive. And that really just doesn't sit well with me. It's awesome that they invite their community to mod the game, but mods should be the cherry on top of a game rather than its sole purpose. There are so many small things about this game that are really upsetting. Like for example, the fact that you have a body in this game. I get that for some it's more immersive, but I much prefer VR games where you only have a head and two hands. Because for one, my body in Bone Lab rarely matched up with my body in real life. And I would always wind up accidentally getting items caught in my body. Get up. Get the f get up. Or getting my arm stuck somewhere while I was climbing. There's all kinds of little annoyances that happen and it's just a source of needless frustration. And it's always so strange to me that your whole entire body goes backwards just because you push a button. Sometimes when you go to grab your gun, you wind up grabbing an ammo clip instead. And then, depending on your avatar, it's also pretty tough to holster your gun sometimes. Equip, I can't, it won't go. The game doesn't have any new enemies for you to fight either. Apart from a pillar that shoots a fireball and a statue that shoots a fireball, there's nothing new to fight here, nothing that changes up the gameplay. There are new skins for enemies, like this biker guy, but these bikers are functionally identical to the null bodies from the first game, which are identical to the skeletons in the new game. Although I must admit that it's more satisfying to make a skeleton crumble than it is to kill an orange guy. The AI sucks too. Guys without guns walk towards you in a straight line. He walks into it with his face. Guys with guns walk towards you in a straight line and don't even bother taking cover. Meaning that standing still and shooting everything in the head is a perfectly viable strategy here, making it all too easy to completely ignore all the cool stuff you're able to do in order to kill everything. I'm also pretty disappointed that there's only a handful of each type of time trial or arena, and some of them are just missions that were part of the campaign that you can replay. These are far and away my favorite things to do in the game, and I really wish there was more. The way your character picks up items just looks so strange and unnatural. It's a little immersion breaking, but I did think it was cool that the game allowed you to mix your very own cup of gamer subs. Oh, fuck. And look at that. They even had my favorite flavor. <laughs> Blue Raz. And the game even let you use the code RENSREVIEWS at checkout to save 10% on your purchase and help out my channel. <laughs> but I will say that everything else in the game is stellar. The music is amazing. Let me be by myself in the evening breeze. 
There is a lot to love here, and while I am disappointed with a lot of this game, I will still continue to happily support Brandon and the rest of his team, and I will continue returning to Bone Lab every now and again to try and beat my times in the trials, goof around in the arenas, and see what the modding community has been up to. Because at its core, Stress Level Zero made a game that is incredibly fun to play. The future of it looks pretty bright too, as I'm sure they'll polish the jank within the next couple of patches and trickle out new free content like they did for the first game. And with hope in my heart, I gaze up at the night sky, ponderously toward Mother Luna, our moon, and I wonder to myself, which Ren's Reviews video should my audience watch next? Probably one of these two. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.